We left off yesterday in 1.5, getting ready to find inverse functions, yes? Yes. And we talked briefly, how do we find inverses? What do we know about inverses? Uh, okay, so if we're looking at a graph, we know there is an inverse if it passes the horizontal line test. How do I find an inverse? This game is what? Oh, um. Okay, so we did talk yesterday that f of x is the same thing as y, correct? Which is helpful to know because we're not going to talk about x and f of x in this problem. We're going to talk about x and y. And what's the inverse relationship? You flip them. You flip them, you flip them right? On the previous page, I think it was the previous page, it talks about in a norm, in the original function, it's a comma b. But in the inverse, then, it's b comma a. So our step one here is going to be to switch x and y. So every place you see an x, you now replace it with a y. Every place you see a y, we're going to replace it with an x. So with that in mind, instead of y equals, I'm going to say x equals. Okay, And that's because I already took f of x out f of x is no longer, you know, I just, we know f of x is y, right? So I see a y, I'm going to replace it with x. Instead of x over x plus 1, we're going to say y over y plus 1. And so that is your, if you want to kind of think steps here, first step is to switch x and y. Okay, so we switched X and Y. Now, after that, my next step is going to be to solve for Y. So in other words, we want to get this back in the form of Y equals. Well, thoughts? Multiply by what? Y plus 1. We need to start by getting it out of that fraction form, don't we? We don't want it in a fraction form. To get rid of a fraction, you get rid of the denominator. So we're going to multiply by Y plus 1. If I multiply the left by Y plus 1, we're going to multiply the right by Y plus 1. On the left, it's Y plus 1 times x. So can we go ahead and distribute? x times y is xy plus x times 1 is x, 1x. On the right, what happens when I multiply that fraction by y plus 1? The whole idea is it's, you can think of this as y plus 1 over 1, can't you? But the y plus 1s will cancel, leave me with y. Okay. What are we trying to solve for again? y. So if we're trying to solve for y, we probably should get all the y's together, one side. I don't want to divide by y. That's going to create more. Because it, and here's the thing. If I divide by y right now, that means I also have to divide this x by y. And we don't want to do that. Because then we're back to a fraction and we're back to ugly. Okay. So let's work to get all of our y's, y terms on one side, non-y terms on the other side. Does that make sense? So if we're going to do that, which way... We can do this two ways. Which way do you guys want to go here? Surprises. Add over. Add over x. And then. Well, and because my brain started to say, we can take this plus x, move it over here. We can take this plus y and move it over here, right? So subtract x over to the right, subtract y over to the left. However, you should have five x. Could we just subtract the xy over here? And get both, because the idea is I want both y terms on the same side. Now, which one makes you guys happier, though? Um, easier. 
Which one's easier in your brain? Which one did I do here? I'm not happy with you. You're just not happy with the problem in general? Is that where we're at? Okay, well, you'll like the next two better, I think, if I recall. This one is a little challenging with the fraction. So, okay, let's go with, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make the y's happen on the left. So it's going to take two movements. I'm going to keep x, y here. I'm going to subtract x over to the right, if you will. And then what about this y that needs to move to the left? I'm going to subtract y over to the left. Now, could you have done this just the opposite? Yes. So on the left, I'm going to subtract the x. It's going to cancel. We still have x, y, and we also have what? Minus y. On the right, y minus y cancels, but then we're also subtracting x, and nothing minus x is going to be negative x. Okay, so that was just getting the y's all to one side, right? Now, we need to solve for y, right? No, because I want the y's on the same side. Oh. Yeah, we can be right back to the beginning. Okay. Now change by the x? I don't want to divide by anything. Because here, okay, here's the deal. If I divide by x here, it helps this term, doesn't it? But that also means I have to divide this term by x. Okay. So instead of dividing anything, can we think GCF? I like that. Look on the left. I put all my y terms on one side. What's my GCF? What's my greatest common factor on the left? Both, Both terms have a y, yes? Let's factor out a y. If I factor out a y... Now you're getting to divide. What's x, y divided by y? x minus, what's y divided by y? Still 1, yes. In parentheses, still equals negative x. How do we get y by itself? <coughs> Now I'm ready to talk divide. Because, okay, here's the reason. It's y times those parentheses, yes? So if it's y times those parentheses, how do we get y by itself? You can divide by that parentheses, which is a factor. So we can divide by x minus 1. If I divide the left, I divide the right. I thought for sure you wouldn't have to divide the line. I was like, why would you do that? So much more That's it. You just have to give me time to get there. Now. So it's just the opposite? So what do we end up here? X minus 1 cancels. Y equals negative X over X minus 1. That's just like so upsetting right now. That looks like so much work to literally just have the signs change. Yeah, that's really Well, it will always be just the sign, just the signs change, okay? I mean, I promise it won't. Um, okay. For inverse function, I would just, um, final thing I would suggest is inverse function notation. So instead of leaving y equals, what is our inverse notation? F negative 1 of x equals negative x over x minus 1. That was a little tricky one, wasn't it? Fractions always make things tricky. I think you'll like the next two a little bit better, if you give them a chance. I do. Hey, they don't want fractions. They look, they look a lot better. But they have square roots. Can you, so? Can you not know? We can Although, I don't know. Roots. Well, I thought so, but then number one on the quiz was not good for oh, square no, roots. It's so. Not good. so maybe we can't handle square roots. I thought we could, but... I don't even do square roots. I just forgot about that. Number one was a little bit of a disaster. I don't remember square root at all. <laughs> well, it, there was a square root in the problem. And I think they did it right. So actually, I'll kind of address something about this in part B. Because, yeah, number one on the quiz was rough. Okay. 
Let's try example B. What's my first thought? Keep the switch closed. Oh, no. Okay, that sounds like multiplying fractions or adding negative or subtracting <laughs> integers there. So, what do we know about f of x? That's the same thing as y, yes? And so then, when we write the inverse, x's become y's, y's become x's, right? So instead of y equals, I'm going to say x equals. Square root of, instead of 4x, I'm going to say 4y minus 3. Okay. With that in mind, how do I solve for y? Okay, how do we get rid of the square root? We're going to square both sides of the equation which is something you had to do on the test. However, before you can square both sides of the equation, you have to make sure the radical is <coughs> by itself. And that's the issue a lot of people ran into on the test. And then things just went weird from there. Okay, but on the test, the radical is not by itself. And if we get a chance, we can look at that today at the end of class. But radical by itself. So can I go ahead and square this then? In this one, I can't. If I square the radical or the right side, I have to square the left side. What is x when you square it? x squared. What happens when you square square root? It's whatever's under the radical, yes? Okay. How do I solve for y? I would prefer to add 3 since it's a minus 3. <laughs> so if I add 3, can I flip this as I go here? I'm going to say 4y equals x squared plus 3. Focus up here, please. How do I get the y by itself? Divide by 4. Divide by 4. <laughs> And so then, 4y divided by 4, I have y equals. Now, how did I write this in my notes? Because we could write this one of two ways. You could write it as x squared plus 3 over 4. Or, in my notes, I have it as, I did more of a divide both pieces by 4. Let's see. Gosh darn it. Do it that way. You could also do it that way. Okay? Both are right. Neither are wrong. It just depends on the situation of what you need. Do you have a preference for this? Not necessarily, unless we have to do something else with it, if that makes sense. Hello. I will send her your way. Okay, bye. Your keys to ramble. I'm not, I promise. She doesn't know how to open my door. <laughs> okay. So, to answer Kylie's question, you just left the room. Uh, you know, I can handle it either way unless there's a reason we need it one way or the other. Does that make sense? So, now if we talk about x squared over 4, you can think of there being an invisible 1. So, we can think about this as 1 fourth x squared plus three-fourths. Um, again, I don't necessarily have right versus wrong there. So what would be like the reason why we need it? If you're trying to figure out the graph or something, maybe. Like, I can figure out this graph, one-fourth x squared plus three-fourths. At least I can visualize it a little bit better than x squared plus three over four, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, again, if you're just finding the inverse, I'm happy with either. Okay. Um, don't forget, I'm going to rewrite it. Instead of y equals, I'm going to say f inverse of x equals. So, one fourth x squared plus three fourths. And, you know, if you'd rather say f inverse of x equals 
x squared plus 3 over 4, like I started to leave it, I'll put them both up there. Okay, C. What are we doing? Okay, we're going to switch X and Y. Now, keep in mind, F of X is Y equals, right? So if I switch X and Y, this is X equals 4Y squared minus 7. How do I solve for Y? Okay. <coughs> It's minus 7. Let's start by adding 7. I'm going to pull a switcheroo here. So 4y squared is equal to x plus 7. We're going to divide by 4. I think I'm just going to... I'm going to divide by 4 like that. Force cancel. I have y squared equals x plus 7 over 4. What do I do now? Take the square root. Yes. If it's y squared, in order to get y squared to become y, we're going to take the square root. Now, why do I not have it in my notes? What should our brains be thinking? What'd you say? I'm looking at something up because I want to double check here. But what do we normally do when we take the square root in an equation set? Why I didn't do it here in my notes. Is there a reason? Or did I just overlook it? I don't see this example in the notes. But I'm going to go with it. It should be there. Okay. What is the square root of y squared? Y. What's the square root of x plus 7 over 4? Okay, square root of x plus 7 over 4. Or we could say square root of x plus 7. What's the square root of 4? 2. 2. You could say that, which is why I kind of did that. Now, when you take the square root in an equation setting, you should say plus or minus. Oh. And I don't have that in my notes, which is why I was trying to figure out, is there a reason I don't have it in my notes, or did I just overlook it in my notes? Does that make sense? Like 50-50 shot. So general rule of thumb, I'm going to say you need to consider the plus minus. If I rewrite this in inverse notation, f inverse of x is plus or minus the square root of x plus 7 over 2. Okay. Now, as we move on to the bottom of the page, inverse reflection principle. A known fact is that a function and its inverse are symmetric across the line y equals x. Can you visualize the line y equals x? What line is that? A linear. Just she's down here doing this. Yeah. It would have a <laughs> slope of one. Yes. Y-intercept of zero. So if we're talking about the line y equals x, something like that, right? What's sometimes referred to as the perfect diagonal line. So right there, symmetric across the line, y equals x. I'm gonna use. I think this will work. I'm going to use A as my example. If we go back and graph A, I 
and doing this on the fly, which is not always a good thing. <coughs> okay. Switch over to this. I don't even think, oh, didn't even turn the elbow on this morning. If I go back to A here, the one you guys complained about. So the original function was x over x plus 1, yes? The new function is negative x over x minus 1. If I graph those, okay, so in the blue is my original function, in the red, that's hard to tell there, is my new function, my inverse. If I graph the line y equals x, the idea is that my graph is reflected across that line. And this might not be the best one to show as that example, because you kind of have to look. What's happening here is I've got a blue piece down here, yes? Do you see the red piece reflected across from it? It's right there. In fact, they even almost meet there at the origin. I have this blue piece up here. Where's the reflected version of it? Down there. So the idea is that the graph, if we fold it at that diagonal line, that's showing that, yes, they are inverses. Okay? Even though you complained we just switched a couple signs, they are inverses. Okay? That was my other ones. We didn't just switch a couple signs. We had to do other work, didn't we? Okay, so I wanted to kind of demonstrate what that is there. Is that, you know, a reflection across the line y equals x. Okay, now we're going to talk about that down below. We're also going to talk about the inverse composition rule. And this is a function f is 1 to 1 with an inverse function g if and only if when you compose the functions, it equals x. We did this last year in algebra 2, but if you have a function and it's inverse, so like last year we did like f composed with f inverse. If they are truly inverses, when you compose them, you'll get x. And it has to work both ways. So if you do f inverse composed with f, you have to get x. Okay? Here it's just talking about fog and golf. So we're going to look at the symmetric reflections here in example 5, and then down in example 6, we'll look at the fact that a function in its inverse will always equal x. Okay? Now, we're going to go down to example 5 here. Sketch the graph of the inverse function for the function drawn on the grid provided. Okay. Thoughts on how I'm going to sketch the inverse. What? Same thing, either side. Same thing, other side. But how do I make that happen? Okay. So could you try and trace that diagonal line in there? You can. Okay. And that will help to an extent. Okay. I don't know how well you guys can see that, but I didn't want to make it too big. So it has to reflect across that diagonal line. Now, does that line maybe help you a little bit? Yes. What's the other thing we need to think about? We don't have an equation, though. We weren't given an equation for this lovely graph. Intercepts? Well, what do we know about whether it be a zero, an intercept, any point? What do we know about any point on the original function? We have a point. Negative 1, x equals negative 1, and y equals 1. Or y equals 1. Okay, so let's go with this point here, right? What is the ordered pair there? Negative 1, 0. What do you know about the inverse? 0, negative 1. 0, 
negative 1, 0 on the original graph is going to become 0, negative 1 on my new graph. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? So it's not, you don't just have to try and draw this graph and figure out how it reflects. So 0, negative 1 means I'm going to have a point down here. You guys also talked about, look like there's a point at 0, 1. 0, 1 on the ori original graph becomes what on the inverse? 1, 0. Okay. Um, I would say, I don't know, does it look like maybe there's a point at 1, 2? Close enough? I'm just trying to give you guys some things to draw. If there's a point at 1, 2 on the original graph, what is that on the inverse? 2, 1. And maybe it's not exact, but this isn't an exact graph. We're just, I'm trying to get the idea through to you. The only other thing I would think about, at some point, my graph crosses my diagonal line here, yes? I don't know what at what point that is, but think about it. If it's on the line y equals x, what is it when you switch it? It's going to be the same point, isn't it? Like if this is at, say, negative 1, negative 1, it's not quite there. But what is negative 1, negative 1 switched? Still negative 1, negative 1, yes? Okay, so from here, I know this doesn't look great because now it just looks like, oh, we're drawing a line. But you're reflecting, yes? So... Like what I would say is between these two points here, my ones on the axes, notice my graph curves away from my reflection line. So what can we do here? We can curve away from my symmetric line. Here, in between these next two points, it curves in towards the line. Okay? This one is going up and away from the line. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to cross the diagonal. I'm going to go out and away from the line. Down here, I need to cross through that point. This graph goes down. Where's my re my inverse going to go? It's going to go left. Because the idea is if I fold this line on the diagonal, it's going to overlap. Okay. Hopefully I gave you a few, a few pointers along the way there. Maybe. Maybe not. I tried. Okay, so that's the idea of what a graph in its inverse will look like. Okay, takes pick some points, flip those ordered pairs, try and, you know, okay, reflect it along that line, right? Draw the same thing on the other side. Okay, one more example, and that is example six. Show algebraically the F and G are inverse functions. Okay, what's it say up here? If f and g are inverse functions, what must be true? When you compose them, you get x. So we're going to find fog and gone. Okay, and we're going to do the algebra here. So f composed with g of x, so fog, f Compose with G of X. That's saying I'm going to take G and put it into F, correct? So what is F? F is something cubed plus one, yes? Does that work for you? If I'm taking G and putting F in... <clears throat> F is something cubed plus 1. What is the something I'm putting in there? Cube root of x minus 1. What happens when you cube a cube root? It's whatever's under the radical. Same thing as squaring a square root earlier. So then under the radical is x minus 1. What do we also have over here? <coughs> plus 1. What's x minus 1 plus 1? That's x. 
So does that show that they're inverses? That's half of it, yes? It has to work the other way, too. So right there, we showed that fog is x. And now we're going to do the same thing with Goff. So it's G composed with F of X. So I'm going to take F and put it into G. So what is G? G is the cube root of something minus 1. Does that make sense? So if g is the cube root of something minus 1, I'm going to put f in there. What is f that I'm putting in there? x cubed plus 1. Clean up under your radical. What is x cubed plus 1 minus 1? Okay. So now it's just going to be the cube root of x cubed. What's the cube root of x cubed? It's x. What just happened? We showed that both the function and its inverse, or the inverse and its function, both composed to be x. And so we have proven that these are inverse functions. If we graph them, they would appear to be reflections across the y-axis, or excuse me, the y equals x line. Okay? And you could look at that on the graph. What do we have there? x to the third plus 1. And the cube root of, what is it? x minus 1. Yeah. Okay, I left that middle line on there. Similar to what we just drew. Okay, and that, you know, just goes to show, you know, that's showing the reflection there. <coughs> okay, your homework is on page 122, or starts on 122, I should say. You're doing 1 through 6, 9 through 12, 14 to 22 evens, and 23 through 29. Fourteen through twenty-two. I just realized there's something in the homework about give the domain. Don't worry about that. <coughs> okay, so ignore the directions that say something about give the domain of f inverse. Just find the f inverse formula. And then, of course, homework is due.